Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cybersecurity Matters podcast. My name is Christian Redshaw, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Mr. Dominic Vogel. Dominic, tell us who we have in the virtual hot seat today. Well, today we have our first ever uh, guest from Australia, but even though she's based in Toronto right now, uh, Christine Smalley. She is a senior a senior security engineer, I should say, at Paytm, a uh, very large organization which is based in, in India. Mm -hmm. uh, really interesting uh, uh, person, very interesting backstory in terms of how she got to cybersecurity. So let's bring her on. It'll be let's a fantastic convo. All right, so we'll bring Christine in and we'll be right back. Christine, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to chat with Christian and I. We're really looking forward to what I'm sure will be an absolutely epic convo. But thank you for joining us today. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. Well, we have uh, diversity in this show and we have uh, a new accent. I don't think we've had an Australian accent. I don't think we've had an show. Australian uh, guest. So yeah. <laughs> for, for that alone, I'm, I'm stoked. Um, so, so the first question is, we want to get to know you a little bit, just um, for the audience that doesn't know who you are. Can you just tell us, you know, the, the background that you come from? Because cybersecurity is a bit of a, a more recent field for you. I think you come from an academic background, if I'm if I'm Yeah, right I do. That. Indeed. So, well, with where I'm at currently, I'm currently a security engineer at Paytm. So, those who don't know us, it's the largest e-commerce ecosystem in India with over 350 million users. Um, and so I joined the team here 18 months ago. I joined the field just a little bit before that. So as you mentioned, it is recent, at least professionally. So before I moved over, I was doing, I was in academia. My background's actually philosophy and literature. Hmm. And so I held roles in finance and government, but they were all alongside my academic pursuits. And the way that I transferred into the field, so I'm largely self-taught, that I ended up going to Russia to pursue my research. And so when I was there, I was exposed to a whole different side of technology that just by being aware of my surroundings, that you get there. And I remember at one point, so arriving in Russia, my Russian wasn't great, and I'm the inclined. <laughs> my Russian's not very good either. <laughs> <laughs> Let me off the hook. Thank you. Um, so, need to find the books for my research. It's also not so easy then to source English language books. And so, I'd find myself on e libraries looking for what I needed. And one day, coming across this pop up from the FSB, supposedly, that was telling me that it had detected some sort of activity on my computer that I was now, you know, trying to work. And this was all in Russian as well trying to work out that I apparently violated something or other. I need to transfer them some money via a self-serve kiosk in a local convenience store to a certain number. I thought, well, that's okay. That's a bit odd. How does this sort of pop-up come about that knows my IP, knows my browser? And just through being there, the sort of things that you face, I'd never faced before, at least growing up in Melbourne, and I was also in a community of very cyber savvy peers. Mm. So there were like my own background. So I did, I used to work as a teenager with my dad who was an IT support technician. So I knew a thing or two, but then this just exposed me to a whole new realm. And I mm. became more and more curious and just through you know, circumstance being curious, began to pick up a whole, entirely different skill set to the one that I went to Russia intending on refining and so then coming to Toronto I came here originally for a PhD in the literature and philosophy but then realized quite soon that I'd answered a lot of the questions that I'd started with in that field and my interest had really being captivated with some of what I'd been exposed to and what I'd had a chance to start doing while I was in Russia so I made the decision to make the the transfer into cybersecurity and mm. yeah that's that's where it all began wow um, i've never <laughs> never heard uh, quite that uh, that's an that interesting story <laughs> before it sounds like the beginning of a really cool movie if it if it stays exciting like this you should definitely uh, get a screenplay going and uh, well, yeah, well could, it has been so far yeah, yeah things don't become dull like it it only heats up once you get in into cybersecurity yeah, so Melbourne, um, Russia, 
Toronto, mm -hmm. where is next? This is, <laughs> this is what we'll stay tuned for. Um, I do have a follow-up question, if I may. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, on Paytm, you are part of the security engineering team. There's so many different yeah. aspects we, we've talked uh, before the show. Um, so many, re so, so many uh, aspects of cybersecurity. Uh, what is a security engineering team? What is it? Right. What does it do? And, and can you say it in layman's terms so that our non-technical yeah. viewers may um, uh, track along? Absolutely. And I'll start by saying, so I am so happy to have ended up on my team because when you're getting into security, there's a few entry level roles that, you know, there's the, the stock analyst, um, consultant roles. So, so engineering security operations itself. center is the SOC. Oh, yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. <laughs> so the security operations center, the SOC center, yeah. um, up in, you know, the role zone for reviewing the logs of activity of what's happening on various systems, looking to detect anything abnormal. My role, on the other hand, so in an engineering team, we will then sort of build up the technologies to improve the security posture. So I'll try and break this down. So, you know, you look at your system and there's a few things you need to do. So you need to identify the assets, you need to harden your systems. But then if you have teams which are coding your software, that code is something that you want to, you need to take, want to take security into account when you're doing the coding. Because mm -hmm. if you don't take security into account then, you're going to have a product which is then vulnerable um, and that's where that product can be hacked. So you want to shift left, you say then that that's part of the terminology that shifting left into the development before mm -hmm. that bug ever had a chance to get to production. And so to do that, you then need code review. And so there's a few different types of code review you can do. You can do static code analysis on the code itself when it's not being run, it's not part of the software it's not part of the dynamic software itself yet, right. or you can then run dynamic code analysis. So you have components like that. You then have all of your assets are connected to the network. They'll have places they can be accessed. Mm -hmm. You then want to be evaluating your security posture from an external point of view. So what is exposed? What's mm -hmm. publicly available? Do you have Internet-facing IT assets. Exactly. And so, for example, if you have an administration panel that gives you insight into your entire infrastructure and so if anyone who logs in can have permission to delete servers, like if that's publicly facing, then you potentially have an issue that, well, someone would need to brute force that. But if that doesn't need to be publicly facing, if there's no use case for something to be exposed, don't expose that. Mm -hmm. So that's part of it. So the code analysis, the external security posture analysis or you then have and that's connected as well to the term penetration testing which mm -hmm. some of you audience might have heard about um penetration is penetration testing is then going a step further not only identifying these vulnerabilities but trying to exploit them so basically and hacking into the system on purpose and it's the good the good guys or the good people doing that yes exactly to identify to get there before a bad guy does Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's very good. Um, and then what further? We have endpoint detection and response, which is having what's called agents or a way to monitor each of your assets, each of your laptops or servers to detect abnormal activity. And so on my security team, we, we sort of do everything which is a mile, mile wild and an inch deep. So, I get a little bit of exposure to each of this as often the larger your organization, sorry, the larger your organization grows, the more often these parts will be specialized. Mm -hmm. So you then have a team entirely um, devoted to the penetration testing. You'd have a team devoted to the endpoint detection response. Mm -hmm. But we are, when now, actually, when I joined, we were four people. We've now grown to, to seven. And then we have a remote team. So it's an Indian company. So we have another 12 over there. But when you have a relatively small team trying to do security for an organization of 15,000 staff, mm -hmm. it gives you a lot of exposure to several of these verticals. So 
that's a I hope that then adds to your question of what actually looks like to be on the security yes. team doing operations. Absolutely, absolutely. No, that, that's incredible insight, and, and you know, I think you did a masterful job there of, of breaking that down and uh, well, uh, somewhat seeing the conversation in a different spot. You know, something that, that you and I were talking about when when we uh, first chatted a few weeks ago was that whole concept around buzzwords in in, in the industry. You know, yes. and you know, I've been in cybersecurity you know, for fifteen years, and uh, I still get. Confused on all all the sorts of different buzzwords that are that are uh, especially now you know it, it's really hard to figure out sort of hype first reality uh, fact from fiction and what a certain buzzword means or if there's any value behind that word um, mm -hmm. in, in in your experience and in, in your thoughts so how, how sort of how dangerous are buzzwords right now in terms of really trying to move the industry forward because with with many of these words they end up losing uh, uh, all value or all meaning behind them. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, that's a lot of the questions I asked when I came into the industry were around how we're using these terms, because that's you know, there's words that you know, cyber or cybersecurity. What is that compared to infosec? Or when we talk so often about passion and diversity, these things hold a lot of value. But if you keep on sort of throwing out the word without questioning, what does this mean? If you want to hire a diverse team, then that and that's what becomes dangerous because so let's look at diversity just for one i would never want to be a diversity hire i wouldn't want to be the token female on a engineering team yeah. and but yet diversity is important and why um so if to have a chance to sort of dive in perhaps to that one if we consider diversity a potential buzz if it becomes a buzzword it becomes dangerous yeah. Because we're no longer looking at diversity, which goes beyond being skin deep. So diversity for me, for example, is the fact that wherever background you come from, you'll be overcoming unique challenges to where you're from. That will then lend, give you a unique skill set, which you are then able to contribute to the team. So for me, being on the security team, it's as much as you know, where I come from with an academic background, the fact that I'll question you know, what terms mean, but also my skill set is seeing the bigger picture and understanding the connections between, like a lot of my role was connecting theory from philosophy and psychology to case studies. In On the team now, I, I'll bring that skill, um, that skill set to my work when what we just talked about in terms of different systems, yep. I'll ask how does a finding from one system allow us to improve the configuration on another so that doesn't happen in the first place? And so diversity really is about bringing your own background to the team in a way that you have unique skills that someone with your background wouldn't have. And I think if we lose sight of that and just start looking to tick the boxes, we lose some of the the power that diversity offers us. Yeah, and and and, and that's such an interesting um, uh, you know d d description there. And you know, one of the things which I know from my personal experience is, uh, especially in in my various corporate uh, uh, roles before I you know left corporate, uh, was that so many of the security teams I was part of that their composition they that they all came from the same career path they're all it people you know they all came from you almost had group think in which uh, and i always mm -hmm. say for a, any ecosystem to uh, not not just survive but thrive you need to have diversity of thought experience you know di diversity all across mm -hmm. the table there Absolutely. and you know and, and it's funny because and we were just having a conversation uh, uh, about this as well in which you know when i entered industry you know issues like patch management that was an issue 15 years ago Fast forward 15 years to today, most organizations still struggle with patch management. Why is that the case 15 years later that we haven't solved that problem? And I think, again, because you know, there still hasn't been enough of a push from that broader diversity. Hopefully 15 years from now, we'll have solved that damn problem. But uh, you know, it, it, it's um, like you're saying there, you know, making sure that it's not, especially concepts like diversity, aren't devalued uh, through mm -hmm. them becoming a, a, a buzzword. And, um, you know, somewhat segueing in, in, into a, uh, another question and another topic that you Actually, and I have been I might, I might jump in yeah, go ahead, if go I can. Ahead. One of the things I love about the team is just that everyone is so different to me. Yes. The fact that, you know, things which, like, I discovered things that I absolutely love and could just 
dig into for hours, other members of the team actually sort of say, well, actually, if you're happy doing that, please, please take it because that's the least of my favorite things. Yeah. And then for me, things which I would rather avoid, they thrive in. And that, you know, if you want to talk about optimizing your workforce, yeah. you know, that's what you need. That's so, that's so, so yeah. true. You know, and I love that con- concept of uh, optimization, you know, uh, rather than just trying to uh, assemble a team or in many organizations, there's a security team there, but they're only there for lip service or just to fulfill an audit requirement. You know, uh, again, going back to having the ro- right motivations in terms of why an organization does cybersecurity and, um, you know, uh, something which we were just talking about uh, before we, we started recording was that, um, I guess that confusing concept of, you know, some people call it IT security, some people call mm-hmm. it information security, some people call it cybersecurity, um, you know, it could be all of the above. Yes. Uh, in your mind, you know, having all these different terms, is that necessary? Does that add to confusion? Uh, could we be consolidating those terms better? Should we maybe not even be calling it cybersecurity? Should we be calling it cyber risk or just risk management? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think the different terms, as long as you're defining them, Mm-hmm. There is a use that even, so it's focusing on one, the cybersecurity versus perhaps information security or infosec. So I honestly think, I think you can do your job well without necessarily needing to, you know, whether you refer to it as one thing or another, if you're doing a job well, then the words themselves in that context might not matter. But if you want to understand your approach to your task and your responsibility. I believe that, I mean, coming in, I had sort of a intuition that these words were being used slightly differently. But really when I dug into it and started asking, I learned that, well, InfoSec was understood as an earlier model which prioritized the security of information, the security of data and security of systems, whereas cybersecurity as a term then emphasizes the business processes and recognizes that security shouldn't inhibit business, but should enable. And so that's where, and once again, someone who my entire background lends itself to understanding, well, you're doing your job, but what is your mindset? What is your approach? What are your priorities? How do you understand your role in this organization? I believe then understanding what cybersecurity emphasizes over perhaps uh, the, the out, you know, outdated terminology of infosec that then helps you position yourself and prioritize accordingly so i think then and it depends once again on yourself that you can do your job just as well to some understanding it as infosec but you know with my mindset i want to understand what you know what are the debates what are the differences of approaches and so that's where i believe the terms are important and having these conversations and going back and forth to be able to understand them in more depth. But that said, there's also sort of a limitation that that's not then going to be the responsibility of everyone. For, for, for sure. And, and one more quick question and before I hand it over to Christian for our, our final question yeah. is in, in terms of, you know, what, again, from your opinion, in terms of threats that are facing organizations, maybe primarily small and mid-sized organizations, uh, what do you feel are some threats and or, you know, areas of focus or prioritization <clears throat> that small and mid-sized organizations should focus on in terms of trying to best deal or combat uh, cyber risk? Mm-hmm. I'd say some of it's a sort of insight into what you have, yeah. education about what vulnerabilities exist, that it's very hard unless you have some awareness around the attack vectors that someone might go for. There's no ways that you need to secure, but then also outdated infrastructure that you might not be aware of what assets you have. But if one of those assets can be compromised in a way that someone can then pivot onto your net main network, that you know, it's so to track back, I'd say the main threat are things that the unknowns, um, assets you have that you might not be aware of in part also then things a lot of the large breaches we see come back to basics so patching general awareness that yeah yeah, i'd say those 
doing the basics right and, and doing them well you know yeah. that, that, that's uh, um yeah couldn't agree with you there more <laughs> uh so uh, christian uh, final question to you perfect so christine zooming out a little bit into the big picture of cyber attacks and how how wonderful a career it is for criminals and, and lucrative <laughs> um through the eyes of a, of a criminal are they targeting the big companies with robust protections in place the enterprises is it you know the level below that is it the 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 very small organizations in other words for the smaller companies should they just not worry too much about it because it's those big juicy targets that they're after absolutely not um sometimes the attackers will go for the easy targets mm -hmm. which are the companies which are unprepared and so that's where you know, if you can encrypt if you can get ransomware onto a system and therefore you know if the company has anything of value that they need to keep going any data they need yes for their business <clears throat> to be enabled to continue going if yes an attacker can get in and encrypt that then that's going to be just as effective and so it depends where the opportunities are mm -hmm. and the opportunities are going to be most likely with the companies which aren't expecting it yes yeah no the, the couldn't, couldn't agree more there. Very and, well and, said. And, and, and Christine, um, thank you so, so, so much for taking time out of your busy day to join us. You you stepped up, you delivered. That was legit awesomeness. That was a great convo. Yeah. So uh, thank you so, so, so much. We, we, we appreciate it so much. And we look forward to having you back on the show in, in the future. Great. Thank, thank, you, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to talk to you guys. So from Australia to Russia to <laughs> Toronto to who knows next. Yeah. Uh, we just got the first quarter of the movie of Christine's <laughs> life. So really excited to stay tuned for that. I think the big thing, the big takeaway for me is the power of diversity and, yeah. and the meaning of words and what, what diversity really means on a security team for a company. A absolutely. I, I think that she brought up some really interesting uh, concepts uh, uh, as well around buzzwords and how, especially in cybersecurity, that's an industry rife with buzzwords. And with buzzwords, those words lose meaning over yes. time. So I think it was really interesting that she was talking about that, you know, especially words like diversity, that we don't lose track of what they actually mean mm -hmm. and they don't be they don't become devalued in, in the process of becoming a buzzword. Yeah. So thanks everybody for watching. You can check out our other podcasts on conversations that matter TV or you can listen to us wherever you normally listen to your podcasts. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Mm -hmm.